This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1635, Rogue One, a Star Wars Story Movie Review. I'm Adam Murdo. I'm Shane Kelly. And I'm Chris Everly. The Dancing Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Everly, the Dancing Queen. Nowhere near as rhythmic, though, as the ABBA classic, I can assure you. <laughs> hey, si- Star total- Wars. I'm not going to be but Star uh, Wars. That's-, that's a great skit. Uh. I'm already going off topic a little bit because in the car today, Matt was driving along with me. We're going somewhere. And on the radio came Africa by Toto. Oh. Okay. I love it. Matt looks at it now. It was set so that it saw the title of the song and it says Africa. And he goes, oh, Africa by Toto. I whip my head around. I'm like, how do you know that? I, I, I buy that he might know the song because I, I hear it all the time. But I'm like, how do you know it's by Toto? He's like, I don't know. I just do. <laughs> okay. Proud Papa moment. Africa by Toto. Good on you. It was awesome. Just by being in your august presence, he yeah. absorbed. <laughs> yeah, <Cold> right. Osmosis. <laughs> if it was about Star Wars or comics, maybe. <laughs> Music, I'm a little bit shaky. Totosmosis. <laughs> Totomosis. <laughs> All right. Well, we have gathered here, the three of us, to discuss the latest offering from the Disney Lucasfilm uh, industrial complex. <laughs> Star, a Rogue One, a Star Wars story. That is the yes. official title. So we've all seen it. I've seen it twice. I've Shane, seen it twice. Seen it twice. Murray, you've seen it once. I have managed to see it only once. Which, that's ample for our purposes here. And uh, we're going to take the next half hour or so and just bat the breeze mm-hmm. when we think about the film. A yeah. yep. little bite-sized episode here just to tide you all over. A snippet. Here in these uh, post-Christmas doldrums until we can give you something a little more substantial. With some oomph. And I, I look forward uh, to seeing what listeners have to say on the forums as well. And as a, as a personal side note, damn good to be in the studio yet again, mm-hmm. brothers. <laughs> I've been here in, I think, three months, so it's... I haven't been here in a while Welcome back myself. to Echo Base. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Minus the wampa, I hope. So mm, Yeah, but it's... We already ate him. With the wind chill outside, it, it's, it, you could almost believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's... Uh, we start with our just our initial uh, impression of the film. Shane, you should go first. You're the big Star Wars fan. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, I think for for Disney's first attempt at a standalone Star Wars story, I thought it was well executed. Good story, good effects. Um, I know there's computer generated things in it, but a lot of practical effects from the way some of the articles and some of the Clips I saw on the interwebs uh, said, uh, loved the acting, loved the actors, really loved um, Alan Tudyk and his portrayal of K2SO. Or K2- He's Wash from Serenity. My God. Yeah. He was the voice of King Candy in Wreck-It yep. Ralph. Yep. I did not realize that he learned to walk on stilts yes. and was interacting with everybody right there versus... Others, like a, like a Rocket Raccoon, where Bradley Cooper kind of records that stuff separate from right. being on... Which is fine. I mean, no big deal. I mean, it, it happens. Um, but I, I just had no idea how much he put into it to do it. And, and it was fantastic. So, yeah. I loved it. Sir Murdo? Ah, well, my memories have faded somewhat over the past two weeks. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I do remember uh, enjoying it. I uh, was compelled to see it in 3D um, because uh, that was the the only showing I was able to f- squeeze into my schedule. That was the first way I saw it. Yeah, yeah. So, I, and I think I'm convinced by that experience that uh, it didn't really lend that much uh, to the viewing experience. It, it was I enjoyed uh, how f- seeing how far the technology has progressed since the last time I tried watching a 3D movie. Um, but I kind of got desensitized to it pretty quickly, and uh, it became kind of transparent to me by the end. Um, but uh, that, of course, is uh, 
no reflection whatsoever on the movie itself, uh, which was uh, very entertaining, certainly. Um, it was. It, it struck rather a different and unique tone mm-hmm. uh, from Star Wars movies we've seen in the past. You know, it established from the very beginning that uh, it was kind of. In a, it was sort of running parallel to the grand epic narrative of uh, the original uh, couple of uh, Lucas trilogies. You know, it's, it's a Star Wars story. So it, it, it take, it's one of the new anthology series of films they're doing. It's not, it, it, it's canon, but it's not a part of the, you know, it's not a chapter in this uh, grand right. uh, Joseph Campbell uh, hero's journey kind of narrative <laughs> that, uh, that Lucas was trying to put together. You know, there's... Uh, Barely any trace of a Skywalker in it until like the very end. Um, and Spoilers, so, by the way, for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yes, we'll, we will be uttering quite a few things that would qualify as, as spoilers here. I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very different tone. Uh, it's uh, recognizably Star Wars, just joyously recognizably Star Wars. Yeah, I think this is exactly what Star Wars fans have really been jonesing for. For I, I think even more so than The Force Awakens last year. This this scratched a particular itch for me since this takes place in the same time period as the original trilogy. I think trilogy. it did that for a lot of people. We've yeah. all known and loved. I mean, it, it, it evokes that so well in a number of ways. Little subtle things here, visual and uh, sonic cues. Uh, it introduces a bevy of interesting new characters, although one... No lamentable point. One one thing that detracts from it, I would say, is that we don't get much of a chance to get to know them, as the movie just kind of barrels along. The, the pacing was quite sharp. I'll give it that. You don't yeah. get too many chances to get bored as this movie goes along, as it just jumps from exotic outer space locale to another. Um, and then by the end of the movie, well, <laughs> you've had your only opportunity to get to know these characters, sadly enough. Um, but yeah, I, I my my favorite uh, was indeed uh, K two S O. Alan Tudyk doing more of his excellent uh, voice work there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, the visual effects were great. We got to see some. Well, there's plenty of action. There's some new spaceships. You know, it, it's kind of a prerequisite for any new Star Wars family film to uh, have a couple of new starship designs for us, plus some old favorites. Uh, the outer space dogfights are great. Um, the, the battle at the end was 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 memorable, certainly. Uh, just packed with action, and it does. Uh, it, it, you even get to see a little bit of uh, Darth Vader here and there. Oh. Um, so yeah, Vader being Vader. Um, so in, in general, I was quite. There, there are a couple of, uh, of uh, drawbacks I would uh, cite later on, but in general, I, I, I thought it was quite the exciting thrill ride through a galaxy far, far away. I echo both your sentiments, gentlemen. Um, I got exactly what I was looking for in this movie, in that I was expecting because I, I, you know, we knew the basic premise. So I was expecting a combination of a heist film and like the Dirty Dozen, and that's mm-hmm. basically what the movie was. Yeah. You knew going in, they were all going to die. Like there was little chance that any of these people were going to survive because it was that type of war. war it was, it was, and and, and, yeah. and it's that type of war movie more so than we don't see these people anywhere else. I didn't, I didn't buy that because they could have been anywhere in the rebellion. Yeah. Beyond this, I thought this type of movie, they're not going to survive. I agree. And this is a war film. Yeah. Um, and and as far as Star Wars go, and I, we've talked about these films many times on the air, the comics, all of that. Um, I love these films, and I was very much looking forward to this. And the movie didn't disappoint in the sense that I was expecting a Star Wars version of a war film. Yeah. And that's what you got. That's uh, what I was hoping for. Yeah, it, it was thrilling. Uh, Murder, I agree, the pacing of the movie was outstanding. There was not a lot of moments where you felt that you were just kind of standing still and, and like time was being and space was being wasted. Uh, pacing was great. Uh, action scenes were extremely well done. I really love how they explored the military capabilities of both the Alliance and the Empire, which you saw, I mean, just the amount of equipment the Empire has, these individual planets, like swarms of TIE fighters coming out and, you know, the new shore troopers on that tropical-type world at the end. Uh, All of that was thrilling. Uh, You had, you know, moments of classic Star Wars humor, primarily through that droid. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the actor's name again? Alan Tudyk. Right, who from Firefly and Sonar, he was wonderful uh, in that role. And I also read how he performed on the stilts, oh, sort of channeled phenomenal. the character. Um, visually, you know, we almost take for granted the high expectation we have for these special effects in these movies today. I thought those expectations were met. Uh, you know, I love that it was the U-Wing fighter, the new rebel ship that they showed. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the immaculate attention to the details of that period of the Star Wars history. The uniforms, the clothing. Uh, it was so great seeing the old funky rebel troopers with the big helmets and uh-huh. the, the black vest and you know the gray <laughs> cargo pants and all of that. Yep. Um, right down to the rebel command center with sort of the 
submarine type uh, screens they're using to follow the path of the battle and so forth. And uh, it was like it was like seeing an old friend, which I hadn't seen this friend in such a long time. So it's still that same friend, but they they just changed a little bit as time has passed, and you got that with this film. Uh, but for me, the highlight of the movie, quite frankly, was the last two minutes when the rebel troopers are in that hallway and you suddenly hear the breathing and the lightsaber illuminates. I, I nearly started to weep from excitement because this is the first time in the films we've really seen the true terror of Darth Vader. At, at his, in the suit. At, in his suit. I mean, we all know Vader is capable of that and we've seen you know him choking people and him fighting Luke, but this is him basically slaughtering. Yeah a whole contingent of rebel soldiers and just like wading ants. through them like a cyclone. Yep. And it was thrilling and terrifying because you felt their terror because mm -hmm. he was just, they were like sheep, basically. Yeah. And the pacing in those last few minutes from they're trying to get the plans to from one ship to the next and he's just hacking through them and so forth, I was just on the edge of my seat. And talk about a true, like, Right up to the moment of when New Hope starts, they weren't kidding. Boom, you go right to New Hope. I mean, yep. that's um, – and I was completely fooled in that. I thought that was an actor who looked amazingly like Tarkin and writes, no, 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 they CGI'd his face. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I was like, I, I really thought that was just a guy with some makeup on. Yeah. I was fooled. Obviously, Leia was – CGI, by the way, rest in peace, Carrie Fisher. Oh, devastating news. Devastating. Yeah, um, yeah it was. So, loved it. My, my only, and we'll kind of go off in our general comments, my only real negative for this movie, and I'll, I'll be very frank, I thought the lead actress was woefully miscast. And I know she's a good actress. I never believed her character for one second. I thought she had zero charisma. And for someone who's supposed to be like a surviving by the, the skin of their teeth, you know, resistance fighter, possibly criminal, so forth... I felt she slept, slept, walk through that movie. Like I, I don't know if it was the direction she was given or or what, but there was just I thought that was a vacuous performance, quite honestly. Uh, didn't matter that much to me because it's a movie where it's it's an ensemble of films, a lot of people involved, and you knew they were all going to get killed at the end. So they they all served their purpose and, and served it well. But uh, compared to a, 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 a Ray from Force Awakens, who had tremendous charisma, or of course Carrie Fisher. I thought this 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 actress's performance was Dullsville. but that that was my only complaint for the film. So, I would venture to say it's the best Star Wars film since Empire. Like to me, it's Star Wars Empire in this as the top three films. A lot of people I've spoken to, like Ricky, said he likes it, and my father both said they like it more than Force Awakens. I, I do a little bit, and that's I nothing against Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. I I really love They're Force different Awakens. Movies. They're completely different yeah. movies. Part of part of my love of Force Awakens is is purely nostalgia, for never thinking I would ever see Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, or um, Mark Hamill ever again in that universe. So that was a huge part of of just loving Force Awakens and what J.J. Abrams was able to accomplish, getting them all on board to do it. And now we'll lead into to Episode Eight and everything. Um, I am no fan of 3D at all. I think it's wasted. It usually gives me a headache. Um, but with the circumstances to see it this first time, that's what it was. So I, I went. I took Matt with me, my younger son. And I didn't think it was necessarily wasted. I did get desensitized to it, it where... I enjoyed the beauty of what it looked like. I loved that there was nothing just being thrown out at me, that it was used just to give perspective and grandiose to the universe, to the planets, perspective to the canyons, all that stuff. I, I liked that. I thought it looked very well done for what it was. Not a movie made for 3D. They just kind of put 3D into it. And, and I agree, compared to what I remember of seeing it years ago to now, I think they've done a much better job of, of making it cleaner and look the way it should look if I'm there. So I didn't mind that portion of it. But when I watch a, a movie, especially a Star Wars or a Star Trek or something, and there are ships flying around, I have a tendency to try and follow them with my head a little bit as they, they go around. And when you do that in a 3D movie, 
everything gets foggy or, or um, uh, fuzzy because you're meant to look at it like this because it's 3D. And if I turn this way, everything got fuzzy. So that towards the end when the big battles were going on, that was bothering me. Um, but that's my own fault because I, I, I like to – I get a little bit animated when I'm watching <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of following the action going along. That, that shows you're personally involved. Oh. As soon as uh, K2SO really started getting hit with the blasters towards the end, I – part of me was hoping that at least one person would get out. No. Not that you, I wanted to see them, but but yeah. As, the odds as, were against them were impossible. Yeah. And 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 especially once once the droid got it, I'm like that. That's it. They're all done. If 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 yeah, they're just all done. Not to mention, a significant portion of the Rebel fleet was destroyed. Oh yeah. Because when Vader pops in at the end of the Star Destroyer, and they're just flying into him and everything. Flagship, yeah. I mean, I looked over at Matt, and all I saw were tears streaming down Matt's face, and I was really trying hard to hold it. Not that I'm afraid to cry, but I didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> and then as 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 they went through each character, I I just could, I let loose. The, half the theater was in tears, and I mean, you're talking people from younger than me to grandfather age, all just in tears over what was happening. Um, some most of the the crowd that I saw it with, I don't think knew where this movie was set. They're just moviegoers who, oh, new Star Wars movie, let's go see it. Some of them even thought it was Episode Eight. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but it's just blinders on for, and, and nothing wrong with that. They just don't know it like we know it. It is what it is. Um, I was really hoping for a good war movie in Star Wars universe without a lot of lightsabers, without a lot of jedis and force doing things but but what we got of the force and and different aspects of it i loved right got to see somebody other than a jedi uh, do some his, things or at least have devotion some, to the force some yeah some faith in it and um um th- there's a line that that some people missed a lot of people heard and i was one of them that heard when um, um cassian takes Jin to jedha and he says hold stay right here i have to go talk to somebody and she gets called over by the the one Jedi dude. I cannot remember his name. Shirut Imwe, I think his name was. Okay. Donnie and, Yen. And he's talking to her. When Cassian comes and pulls her away, he says, we're not here to make friends. And she says, well, well, who are they? He explains, well, they're the protector of the Book of Wills, which thrilled me to no end, but nobody in the theater I was in even had an inkling of what that was. In the first novelization, if I remember right, and I think I have a novelization of Star Wars A New Hope at home before when it was just Star Wars. Hmm. When you open the first page, The Adventures of Luke Skywalker from the Book of Wills or something like mm-hmm. that, it says. So I'm like, oh, my God, they said it on screen. Plus also the Guardians of the Kyber Crystals in the Temple. Right, right? and, yeah, and yeah. Kyber Crystals, that's the first time that's been mentioned in a movie. That was always just the cartoons, um, as far as I remember. I don't remember any of the... Did they mention that in Splinter of the Mind's Eye? Maybe. I'm not sure. But again, okay. just another novel, not right. not in the movie. So that was kind of exciting. Um and 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 their use of the force more like um, uh, force sensitive people and people who are devout almost monks with it that was exciting to me. So, like you said, Murray, a different aspect to all of it. Um, loved Commander uh, Krennic. Krennic, yes. Krennic. Orson he was Krennic. He was great, and and part of that's also because he was in a white uniform. You know, the Grand Admiralish right. type uniform. Um. I did not expect Tarkin to be in it as much as he was, but it was thrilling. As the movie went on and the second time seeing it, I can see where there and other people said it. There's just something not quite hundred percent right with his face in in the tone or the shininess of it. There's just mm-hmm. because I went right then to watch A New Hope, and it it's not perfect, but boy oh boy, it's about uh, as close to perfect. I mean, as, granted, I'm, I'm primitive, but it fooled me. Initially. It, yeah, it's it's as close to perfect as perfect has ever been. Um, I thought that they were going to have the guy uh, from Revenge of the Sith just play Tarkin, and it would just look right. different with just some makeup like right. what, what you thought. I never imagined this, so yeah, I was blown away by that, and I didn't expect to see the front of Princess Leia at the end. I expected just to see the back of her with somebody handing her the plans right. or at least telling her about it, and that would be it. Um, my my only complaint about that part is I'm not sure, although others have said this and I agree with them once I thought of it, if I was Senator Organa, I don't know that I would send my daughter into that big battle, which is what he did, essentially. Yeah. But he said earlier she's the only one he trusts. So yes. 
Okay, I get it. I expected a little shuttle ship, a little escape pod to blast away from the battle with one rebel soldier or one of the group of Rogue One right. to get away and hand her the plans at another place. That would also give you Darth Vader tracking them down a little bit yeah. more. Mm, yeah. But the way they did it, that was so dramatic. Oh, it absolutely was. Right and, up to and, the, to New Hope. and some of the stuff that, that we discuss in, in Minutia is, is, is really just that. It's, it's semantics when it comes down to it because 40 years ago almost, who knew – then what would happen with this whole universe? Oh, so to make something like this, which is essentially a, a, a prequel of sorts, um, some things just aren't going to add up, no matter what you do or how much you plan it or how perfect you try to make it. And to me, Vader just tracked the ship just like he tracked any other ship. But I, I really expected just another hop in between there of somebody getting mm. away in an escape pod. Yeah, because the Tantive Four are fleeing the scene. I mean, it, it makes it gives them no credibility whatsoever later on when the person Vader is choking claims that they're on a diplomatic <laughs> mission. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and that's fine. Uh, if this is a consular ship, why did I see you fleeing the scene a few yeah. moments ago? <laughs> but, uh, but other than that, I, I, I really had no complaints about that. It, it is what it is, and, and I'm thrilled with how they tied those two together. Um, loved. I, I, I knew Vader was going to be in it. I had no idea to this extent. Loved the whole um, back to tank scene in his Is that on castle. Mustafar? That is on Mustafar. They don't, they don't give you the name of the planet. Every other planet in this movie gets told this but except it's, that it's one. it's the lava, so you assume it is. You're supposed to assume that that's Mustafar. Which makes sense because that's where he became yep, Darth Yep, that's Vader, where so. he battled Obi-Wan. That's yeah. where he lost every ounce of... His humanity, essentially. Anything yeah. that he had left was on that planet. Even though he became Vader, well... He got the suit on Coruscant right. through the med bay, but that's where he got defeated. That's where he choked Padme. That's where everything happened. So, um, and, and I haven't looked this up yet, but everyone that I was talking to in the theater and, and online, that castle is one of Ralph McQuarrie's designs. Oh, really? From something, which, which is what they said, and I hope so. I just didn't take the time to search for it yet. Um, to me, as, as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, <laughs> it just looked like um, Sauron's castle. Uh, but, boy, very, very well done. And what I liked about that scene, when they show you that, I mean, it, it's hard to see through the, the haze. And the oh, mist, and that's exactly uh, what Vader in his chamber. Hmm? And I thought of Obi-Wan, he's more machine now than man. Yeah. And uh, you just see that the price that was paid. Because he's, just, he's a, a torso and a head floating basically. Yeah. And, and in that restorative tank. And, and if you go back to Revenge of the Sith, he causes it all himself. I mean, a little bit of a tangent. He's trying to prevent Padme's death from the dream he had. Well, by doing everything he did, he caused the dream to come true. Yeah. If he would have just left well enough alone, that, none of this would happen. That's the dark irony of the whole thing. Yeah. The Emperor's web of manipulation uh, so taken to its fruition. One point I wanted to point out was that I like how this film went into the the nitty-gritty and the terrible cost of the rebellion. Mm -hmm. You get the sense of that in, in the main films, of sure. course. But as Murd said, that the main films have this epic grand space operatic quality, as they should. This film is in between that, and it's showing you how they get to this point and the cost of that. Yeah. And one of my, one, I thought one of the most compelling scenes in the film, what's the name of the rebel intelligence officer again? Uh, Cassian. Okay. When he murders that informant. Shoots him right in the back yeah. because he's thinking, "All right, the stormtroopers are here. This guy's weak. He's going to break. So I got to kill him." Yep. And there are no heroes yeah, in war. Exactly. And then when he says at the end, you know, when 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 the, the, all the volunteers come, he says, "Look, we've all been assassins, saboteurs, spies." Yep. And I like that because it reminds you in in this type of war, there's a lot of shades of gray, and you're not going to get that as much as in the main. Films. No, you're not going to get that watching yeah. Han, Luke, and Leia go no. around. And of course not. But to get Han, Luke, and Leia, the points they need to be, all these other people have to perform these acts, some of which are, are odious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to move the, the, and, the and rebellion And almost counter forward. to yeah. being free. Exactly. So I really enjoyed how they took time to show that. And plus, for fans like us, you see Walrus Man and the guy from yeah. the cantina, <laughs> who I guess got off the planet before they blew it up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, Red Leader and Gold Leader. Yes, okay. right. That was actual footage from A New Hope that wasn't used. I, I, I had to be, yeah. The director, well, I figured at first that they just CGI'd him in mm -hmm. and maybe had the actors come in and do voiceover work. Um, I looked up those two actors who I, I'm 
don't remember their They're names. Still alive? One is. One passed away earlier this year. Oh. So it's conceivable that he would have. 2016 claims another. Oh my another god! Victim. It, yeah, 2016 has been horrible. Um, it's possible that they recorded that stuff earlier, but it wasn't. Uh, the article I read was the director was at Lucasfilm Archives and found these reels of footage and said, what are these? Um, somebody said, well, it's stuff from A New Hope that wasn't used. He's like, well, can I look through it? And they said, sure. So he started going through, holding up all this film and found these snippets, took them and cut them into the yeah, film. Worked. And <laughs> it just added excess, uh, not excess, extra um, credence to tying it into A New yeah, Hope because... Okay. You had some sense of continuity. You had some of these people survive, and here they were in yeah. uh, A New Hope. Um, you also had Red Five get blowed up real good. Uh, so Luke which, could take his place. Luke could take his place. Right. Like just so many of these little snippets that some of them were very fanboy serving, but boy, oh boy, did I love them. Me too. I mean, seeing Jimmy Smits again as oh, that was Organa, great. seeing the Amon um, Mothma, General Dodonna. Yep. Um, is it Dodonna? Dodonna. Yeah. I always said Dodonna. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, but. You know, an actor looked, who looked like the original. Yep. And uh, my parents, I went, well, the second time I went with my parents and uh, my, my son, both my sons. And my parents, you know, they enjoy Star Wars, but they don't know it the way we do. And they, they just, it, I think like many people, they just enjoyed the movie on its merits for mm-hmm. what it was. And they, and they really found it, it's an exciting, entertaining war film, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think, I think. If that's what they were going for, I think they they achieved their goal because uh, I'm sure it's doing gangbusters at the box office. Yeah. Um, and it, I think it, it gives credence now to the notion of doing more of these standalone films. Absolutely. I know Han Solo and Lando Calrissian is the next one in yep. uh, 2018. Mm-hmm. So as far as Jin goes, I liked – um, how the sh- how how I liked how the movie opened in that I liked a long time ago in a galaxy far far away. I liked the title coming up, Mm -hmm. but I wanted to see around the title like they used to promote Empire Strikes Back with the star and the wars. I wanted to see that come through that. Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily need a Star Wars story, but I I just – I didn't like that it was just Rogue One. Mm -hmm. It's fine, and it didn't bother me to that extent, but I fully expected it to be Rogue One, Star Wars. Like just me, my own personal little – Flavor. Ooh, they were going for stark minimalism there. I mean, just, yeah, uh, yeah. Let uh, kind of uh, confound the expectations of Star Wars fans and let you know from the get go that uh, this is not the kind of Star Wars sto- storytelling you're accustomed to. They've cut out all of the pomp and circumstance. You don't get the uh, Star Wars text crawl, making sure you understand this is the story of some unsung call them heroes of the uh, Galactic Rebellion, uh, whose exploits will not be entered into the same annals as the uh, those with uh, grander destinies, like those of the Star- Skywalker clan. Yeah. So they don't get uh, the, the, the John Williams fanfare. They don't get uh, this long string of text going past the eyes of people galaxies away for their their edification. Uh, no, the story just starts. Just they're in the bleakness yep. and emptiness of space. And, what, and- what do we think about them not... Uh, besides some snippets, they didn't use the Williams music. What did you guys think about that? I was okay with it. Appropriate. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I thought that that would have been counter to what they were trying to do yeah. if they would have added more. I mean, they used it. it at the end, in the, in the end credits. They, they yeah. Used it, but. Yeah. The, I've, uh, Michael, Michael somebody, I think. Michael Giacchino, I think, was the composer. He was the same person who did the music for Doctor Strange. Oh. Um, and, and he only had like four weeks. To write this stuff, if I remember right. Yeah, he was not the original scorer yeah. for this, but uh, he stepped in and uh, uh, he's created what I would call like a, a cognate musical dialect to what John Williams <laughs> did. He, he, drawing on the same sources, you yeah. know, the, the same sort of militaristic yeah. uh, score, or like, and Gustav Holst's Planet Suite, I think, is cited as one of his influences there. And, and but yeah, it huge... sounds similar to what Williams was doing. And at times he did uh, draw directly, sure. right, as you surmise, from, from, he just took a few measures here and there from right. Williams' original scores. And he's a huge Williams fan so like to me that that's a perfect person to do something like this and give it his own little flavor yet still retain some of what we're familiar with without being heavy in it yeah and it's it's necessary because as we've said over and over again by now this is a different kind of movie yeah so it needs a different kind of uh, musical accompaniment let us applaud by the way before i forget so it took what is it for almost 40 years since star wars came Mm -hmm. out 40 years 40 years next year they finally explained why the Empire would have that weakness yeah. in the Death Star. Oh, 
talk I about it was one of the best parts of the movie. I thought that, so too. I, wow, this makes complete sense now. Essentially, I just started yeah. reading the Catalyst novel. I got yeah. it for Christmas, um, which happens before Rogue One, but is centered around um, Her Gale. Father. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so far, it's really good. I mean, I'm only two, three chapters into it, but yeah, I, I was very excited for a purpose. The, uh, part of Star Wars is just going in with. Um, uh, suspending disbelief and I mean we're talking about a space movie to begin with but yeah. but even so just suspending that that they can get the plans and in like an hour figure out what a weakness is this makes more sense that somebody told Jin Jin told them in the meeting with Mon Mothra they told the technicians the technicians found it and boom there you go perfect sense and um, really gives um, not backstory but more more disdain that certain people had for the empire and what lengths they went to to get to to help the rebellion i mean this guy was 15 to 18 years building the death star yeah. making this weapon all the while trying to figure out a way to to make a flaw mm-hmm. if it could help at all and conversely think of think of dedication think of the forest whitaker character Almost like the, the the a version of Vader, like he's like a breathing apparatus. Yeah. And he's been consumed by his quest against against the empire. Against the empire, <laughs> fighting them so zealously that even the rebellion is disavowed right. him. Right, right, right. His part in the movie is is the the to me the most wasteful. Um, not that it's bad, and I I didn't remember this. He shows up in the Clone Wars cartoon when he's pre breathe mask oh, really? and everything. Yeah. I didn't. He's in like four episodes, a four-part thing, and he's supposed to be in Rebels now. Come January for two parts, I think, as more along the lines of the guy who needs the breathing mask and yeah. stuff. So um, I, I, I had no idea. I just completely forgot he was in Clone Wars, um, the cartoon. I don't. I don't have a problem with him being in it at all. Um, but when they were there in his lair, he really didn't serve much purpose. Well, he, other than the go-between for the for the hologram, that was his narrative purpose, and he was also he was there to serve as as a as as an alternative example of what this kind of fight can do to someone, sure, and also to help explain where she came from and why she has these skills, and that's also why. And I'm interested to hear you guys take uh, what's the actress's name who played Jin? Um, Felicity Jones, who is a good actress because I've seen her do other things. Mm-hmm. Ba- the backstory they created for her and what her character obviously went through from it as a child and she was growing up in a resistance cell basically and all of this, the way she, they interpreted her character in the film, I just I never believed her as that character. She just didn't seem hard-bitten enough. She well, just, yeah. it, that's kind of how I felt about Rey in uh, yeah. The Force Awakens. So and, and, okay. I, I was kind of in, I was more inclined to be charitable towards uh, Jin in this movie. Mm. Some of that is, I think, some of the reshoots and rewrites that they did for Rogue One versus what we saw in the trailer. Um, most of those lines we never got in the movie because of things they changed. Mm. Um, and, and, and I didn't have a problem with her or her performance for the most part, but I do think it got better once she was told by the quorum that they were not going to go after the plans mm. and she had to go out on her own. From that point to the end... I did believe her. The, the whole beginning part, I was a little bit unsure of, um, but it, but it wasn't bad. I, I was okay oh, with it. Oh, it did detract from my enjoyment of the film. At no, all. no. It's just that I, I just I was expecting the the way that character was presented and the backstory of that character. <clears throat> the way she was playing the character, she didn't seem hard bitten and damaged enough. Frankly, she was kind of like you know, nice British accent and just kind of <laughs> like all right. I don't yeah. believe you as his character. Just, well, I, 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 again, it was her father. Like yeah. so many things, it's it's your father being in trouble. It's seeing your father after wondering if he's dead or not, telling you that he's only doing what he's doing to safeguard you and protect the alliance. Um, that really turned her tide. Now, I do think that she turned a little too quickly. Like all of a sudden, she's like, "All right, that's it. We got to go get him." Time but is a factor. That's, yeah, time <laughs> yeah. is a factor, and I mean, that's the, the way it's already is. over two hours long. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, I had no, this is things that I've thought of after seeing it twice and talking with people on forums. But just seeing the movie, I had no problem with her or the performance no. or anything like again, that. Again, it's, it's the pacing. It doesn't give you that much no. time to notice such things. 
But yeah, I would actually level a similar criticism, Chris, against most of the characters in the movie, because there are just so many of them being thrown at us rapid fire, and they all, to me at least, came off a bit flat. Well, that's... There's just not I enough mean, time to develop them And all. to be fair to, to, all the, to all those actors, in this type of film, you don't... It's, it's the, the type of movie it is, it, there's not a time to do the kinds of yeah. character development. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. Force Awakens, you got to know the two young leads... Well, a and, lot more. and it this also helped type of movie. that yeah. you already knew half of the cast because yeah. you didn't have to go into that. So mm-hmm. you point. had time to, to learn about Finn and Ray because they're the only two you really need to learn about. And, and Kyler Ren a little bit. Um, but with what you learned of him, you learned enough. More will come later. But, but what you learn about Kylo Ren in that is satisfying. The other two you had to learn a little bit more about. Yeah. Um, and they did that brilliantly um, with Finn meeting Poe and getting... His, getting named the way he did, right. and through Ray's Force vision, was that that was enough at that point. Um, but yeah, th- this it, this with Rogue One, you once um, once they all started getting in there, there was just no way to, to learn. Although all that stuff. I thought, um, who's the intelligence officer going to keep Cassian. Cassian? I thought his character was very well captured. Having him murder that informant. Mm-hmm. Oh, that told you both. It was like, a good character. You knew a lot yes. about yeah. what he was, he was willing what to do. He'd been through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although and you didn't see as much of it after that one no. establishing scene. He seemed more squeaky clean after well, that. Well, because he resisted the temptation to gun down her father. Right, yeah, to right. follow uh, his orders. And yeah. he, he, he had some faith. Yeah, and I that, thought that, that was very compelling. And I really enjoyed the... I, I don't know the names of the characters off the top of my head, but... The two a- actors who played uh, the, the, the Force Guardians. Yeah, Donnie um, Yen and Wen Jing. Y- you, you really felt the deep ties between those two men and what they'd been through. You didn't need to see a lot of it, just little things they said, oh, we've been in tougher cells than this, or the, the sort of the, 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 the love-hate relationship that was there. And, and, and the two of them, their, their characters are Chirrut and Baze. Chirrut's the blind one, and mm-hmm. Baze is the one with the massive gun on his back. I loved absolutely heart wrenching when Chirrut was gunned down after turning on the master switch. Right, um, and his mantra, "I am, uh, I am one with the force. The force is with me. I am." Mm-hmm. Uh, brilliant as a as a prayer goes yeah. for something like that. Loved when Baze came running he out, recites it, recites and, it dying, yeah. and his faith in what they had protected and been through all yeah. those years restored in that last few minutes, and he did whatever he could. Uh, even no knowing he was going to meet his end at that point, yeah, just absolutely brilliant. Any other comments before we move on to ratings? Oh, um, well, uh, to return to an earlier comment here, Chris, about uh, well, the last two minutes of the film yeah. and how you know, affecting and gripping yeah. and terrifying and thrilling those were. Completely agree, but uh, one uh, pro proviso here, I think the movie should not have ended on quite oh, that note. what do you think it should have ended on? I, well, I think they should have inverted it a little bit. They could have shown us that sequence a little bit sooner, maybe before the uh, planet below was ultimately destroyed. Mm. Um, because, to me, my perception of it was jumping into that, those final two minutes, you know, just bridging the gap between this movie and the original Star Wars, uh, it had the peculiar effect of, in my mind at least retroactively reducing that this whole two-hour epic we've just finished watching to a queer little footnote in Star Wars history. Like somehow the sufferings and strivings of these characters we've been asked to care about for two hours matter a lot less than uh, what happens here as Vader slaughters people and uh, creepily CGI'd Princess Leia is handed this message and utters one archivally sampled word, hope, and then roll credits. And it would have been better if we could have seen that, which I did like, Mm. It just had that happen several minutes earlier, and we could have then turned our focus back to the characters who, are, who have given their all so that the rebellion can succeed in this grand endeavor, those who have done the dirty work so that the Skywalkers of the world can achieve their grand destiny, and uh, who in turn have no destiny or future of their own. Mm. They're the ones the movie's supposed to be about. So I really think the movie should have ended somehow with them, not with Princess Leia or Darth Vader or any of that stuff. Yeah. If we could have seen the, that concluding image of Cassian and uh, Jin embracing and kissing as the mushroom cloud approaches right. them to engulf them and, and incinerate them, that the movie could have ended on that image. I, I think it would have served the overall I, I, project well, better. I think that would have been equally compelling. Yeah. yeah they, I mean, I know they needed to check off those continuity boxes and tie it into the, uh, the major franchise beginning film, mm-hmm. but 
that there's a way they could have done that and still serve the movie's own narrative a little bit. And, and I think if you're going to keep it where you at least see um, the ten of E4 at the end, I think the Vader part goes before you see uh, Cassian and Jin die. I think that would have been just a little bit more effective, yet still satisfying. Seeing Vader a little bit earlier, which I don't disagree with, but yet seeing Leia and the ship at the very end, if that's how you really need to end mm. it, yeah. I think that little part of having them die just before she says the whole hope thing would have just been that little bit more. And it brings back in the point that we were uh, pursuing earlier, too, that yeah. it, it's better to have Leia get the plans in some other way. Well, anyway. yeah, and see, and, and if you had that, if you had where Vader comes in just a few minutes earlier, chases down the rebels, they hand off the plans, an escape pod goes off, Vader then follows that and darts out, and then you see the rest of the planet go, and then you see Leia. It, it, it also doesn't reduce a lot of that to that footnote style you're talking about because Vader's in and out because he's not concerned with this now, but yet we still are because we're here watching what happens. And then we'd see the little escape pod meet up with the Ten of E4, hand over the plans, and then the rest of the world moves along as it as it does. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with what you said there, Murd. I, I, think, it, I think it would... I think the way they did it also the Murd described yeah, either one of those and, would work. It, and it's, it's crazy that... No matter how we've talked about it, it all works. One of the comments I want to make is um, the scene where the Rebel Corvette drives the oh. disabled Star Destroyer. What was great about that scene is that two things. One, again, you, the, you see the sheer awesome military might of the Empire and how the Alliance has to use ingenuity to overcome mm-hmm. the fact that... And sacrifice. And sacrifice. In terms of technology and numbers, they have no chance, really. So yeah. they have to improvise if they want to defeat this far more powerful... Uh, enemy, yeah. and that's a hell of a lot more believable than for a little Ewoks destroying a legion of stormtroopers <laughs> on Endor. I don't disagree with that. So you know, as much as I still I love Return of the Jedi, but this that scene I thought really captured mm-hmm. these are the lengths the rebels have to go to that rebel spirit to yeah. try to win just yep. one battle, yeah, which most of them died in, and, and that and <laughs> that's know. where when a new hope towards the end they're like some some line says about how they have few ships. Well, this is why they just. Their first big battle, they lost yeah. a hell of a lot of people, but they had to for what was at stake. Yeah. It was their only chance to get these plans. Um, yeah, I, I, I just thought everything was done to the hilt, really, really almost perfection. Any other closing comments? Thanks to our freaking swears. I, I love the irony of Krennic striving so much to be in control of the Death Star, yeah. <laughs> looking up as it completely destroys him with yeah. no chance of getting out of there. Yeah. And then Grand Marf Tar- Tarkin being a little bit more ruthlessly conniving, not just ruthless. He didn't do... In my mind, he was always the one that was in charge of that project, especially when they showed him at Revenge of the Sith. And now, that's not necessarily the case. He was there in the background. Yeah. He was building it and all. But... Director Krennic would have been the well, guy. Krennic did the work, then he swooped it and took the credit. Then he, he took credit for it, <laughs> just like any uppity-up managerial boss has the ability yeah. to do at times. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Krennic was a great character. Oh, he's, he's he was. The archetypal, self-serving, gutless, uh, imperial dickbag. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, this, this, I agree with you completely. Tarkin, it, it, it is really more of a, a feather in his cap as a legendary film villain, the way he shows up and steps on uh, his own men in addition to you know bullying the heroic rebels he's also an asshole to his the people under him yep so yeah just the two of them the interaction between the two of them was just terrific on both sides although i will say um i was not taken in by the cgi i, I, I saw it for what it was immediately and it creeped me right out <laughs> so maybe i just watch more animation i don't know but it just yeah. it was totally uncanny valley for me and it, it kind of took me out of the well, scenes no one that, no, no one truly dies in. now when you're a movie star yeah, actor, I guess. yeah. Mm-hmm. and 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 i'm a little bit wary of some of that especially given what happened since carrie fisher passed away yeah. because no one knows what episode eight is yet or what was supposed to be episode nine which well, may she very completed well her work in episode she eight. did yeah but we have no idea if she's left okay in episode eight and right. now they have to change things like to me episode seven eight nine we're going to do away with luke leia and han i mean we already have han i really don't never did i expect luke and leia to survive all three of them yeah. especially luke um i i thought there was a chance leia might hmm. uh but to okay. me luke who is going to train ray in some fashion um 
every Jedi Master gets mowed down at some point during the movie so their apprentice can right. grow to the Jedi they're supposed to be. So I never expected any of them to survive uh, all three of these movies. So we'll see what happens now. But Yes, we will. Yeah. Wrecking Swears, Shane? Five. Yeah, four. Four and a half. All right. I think we're all, we were all satisfied. Yeah. So you have provided the median rating there, Chris. It averages <laughs> out to you. <laughs> all right. So have our work completed here? Yeah. Short and sweet. All right. This episode... Is absolutely wrong. <laughs> See, once I get talking about Rogue One, I get really excited and I completely fumble and I could do this for like an hour and a half. Um, visit us at comicgeekspeak.com. Let us know what you thought of Rogue One. I've been talking to people about it almost nonstop every day. Uh, send us an email at comicgeekspeak at gmail.com to leave a voicemail. The number is 267-702-6642. Stop by thecomicforums.vanillaforums.com and let us know what you thought of the movie if you're not talking to me about it on Facebook. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. And thanks to everyone who contributes to the episode. Send in freaking not freaking swears, muddle the merds, because I'm sure we'll come up with some of those at some point. Maybe. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. Uniting the world!